me too. Yeah, really, I appreciate everyone coming on a Friday afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm not going to take a lot of time for intro. Let's just jump into this thing very briefly. I was for uh, 28 years a professor of structural engineering at University of Arizona. Then I left about 30, you know, started this company, Quakecraft, 30 years ago. So we are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Along the way, got some 20 patents or more on different technologies and to the dismay of my mother became a licensed general contractor also. So we do a lot of these projects as design build, as, you, as you'll see in a minute. But the good thing really is that uh, coming from a former professor, today's presentation, I have absolutely no equations or conclusions for you, but only solutions. And hopefully you can appreciate what you can, how you can implement these in, in your projects. Just a few things about housekeeping. I will be making a copy of the PDF of these slides available to you later. And uh, there are some of the slides have some videos in them. Uh, I may not be able to show them to you if you don't have enough time, but the link to those videos there, I encourage you to watch them on your own. We also have a YouTube channel full of 150 projects uh, videos, as well as uh, on our website, there is a place where you can download some of our specs and typical details. So, um, you know, I, I invite you to use those. So uh, what we'll cover today, I'll, I just feel like even though I've been in this field of FRP for 35 years, I bump into a lot of engineers who they say FR who? <laughs> so I've got to give you a brief intro to FRP. And then after that, we look at this the original concept, which was this wet layup application. And I'll show you some cases of that, how we are using that. But then the bulk of the presentation really would be on these new products that we have developed. And uh, you'll see, I'll go through a bunch of these as much as uh, time permits. Or, and if we don't get to cover them, you'll get the slides you can watch on your own. So the whole, this thing got started back in the, early 80s in the beginning of my career we, as a when I came to Arizona we were trying to come up with a way to repair corrosion damage beams and columns primarily in bridges actually uh, and I'd say jokingly in those days when I had a full head of hair and I was a lot better looking in it was about 1987 where we came up with this idea of using non-metallic like carbon or glass to strengthen uh, these structures uh, the problem was that at the time, those these materials were primarily being used by the Air Force and military. They were really beyond what construction industry could afford. Luckily, about the same time, in the, if some of you are older can remember, there was the end of the Cold War and collapse of the Berlin Wall. So the military's interest in carbon uh, material dropped, and as so did their prices, and it became reasonable to use them in construction. About the same time, there was this 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake where, uh, you know, on this major uh, freeway bridge, the columns, they failed primarily because they did not have enough ties or hoops around the longitudinal bars. So we took at that time this idea that we were toying with for the previous two, three years. We took that from strengthening beams in bridges and we said, what if we took this carbon fabric, wrapped it around columns of bridges, provide confinement and make it earthquake resistant? So the namesake of our company, Quake Wrap, really comes from this one application of wrapping uh, columns. And, and of course, now we've gone far beyond that, you know, in the last 30 plus years. So. FRP products have been used in different industries. For example, in the 50s, you know, uh, Corvette bodies have been made with fiberglass. In marine industry, you know, hulls of uh, boats are made with uh, fiberglass, which is really a lower quality version of what we do. And then the Boeing 787, everything you see in here in uh, gray color, uh, it is, uh, or, or blue, these are all either carbon FRP or a sandwich type construction, which is what we use also, you'll see how we use them. So my point is that these materials really, although civil engineers have not used them, them in uh, many years, but they are being used extensively in other industries. The acronym FRP comes uh, from Fiber Reinforced Polymer. So if you break it down, we have a polymer that I'm showing it here in red. 
the polymer can be either a polyester, vinyl ester, or epoxy resin. And then we are reinforcing that polymer with fibers. The fibers shown here as dots could be either carbon or glass fab, uh, fiber. The function of the resin matrix is twofold. It protects the fibers and it also distributes the load uniformly among the fibers. The one thing which makes composite materials a lot different from other materials you're familiar with is that, uh, for example, you know, steel is isotropic, so it has the same tension in X and Y direction, tens tensile strength. FRP product, their tensile strength comes from the orientation and the amount of fiber in each direction. This is really a beneficial effect that as engineers we can utilize in our design to uh, you know, make the, the design more efficient. But just keep in mind that uh, a half inch thick FRP or a quarter inch thick FRP, uh, that's not enough to, you know, to, to spec it like that. You have to be more clear on how much fiber and in which direction are you placing these fibers. The original materials, uh, the, the concept you know, is, is shown here. Basically, you have rolls of fabric. These fabric rolls are about 600 or 1200 millimeter uh, wide. The white one is glass fabric. Carbon fabric is, is the black one. Then in the field, we saturate these with epoxies and apply them to the structure. So uh, I thought this video shows you the original concept. Here we have several bricks that are not connected at all, no mortar joint between them. And we cut this carbon fabric with, you know, which becomes our reinforcing element. So first he's putting this epoxy, which has its consistency almost like a toothpaste. We put it on the back of the bricks to get rid of any of the sharp edges and make it smooth. And then you take that fabric, carbon fabric, and saturate it with this lower viscosity resin, which is almost like honey. Once this is saturated, you pick up the fabric and put it with your gloved hands on the back of the beam, make sure all the air bubbles out. This maybe takes about half an hour to make this sample. You let it sit overnight in ambient temperature. The next day, when you pick it up with putting the fabric in tension, you see we've created the beam. And, and now we have actually, uh, not only it can support the weight of these um, four men, but you can drive a truck over it. And as you see, when it fails, it's ultimately the brick that crushes rather than uh, the carbon fabric failing. So that was kind of the original idea. Now I want to give it to you as, as an example of a really simplifying it. There's a little bit more, little few steps more than that, but just to give you a, an idea of how these materials are used. Let's, uh, there are by the way, a lot of codes that are available, ACI committee for, for the, you know, our friends in Canada, you have your own code, have been very, you know, involved from early days in using FRP. So let's say we have a slab or a concrete wall that is reinforced with number seven, grade 60 um, steel. So each one of these bars takes a force of 36 kip, and I'm sorry, I forgot to change those for <laughs> you guys that are using now the uh, SI units, but, but in the neck, you'll see it in a minute. So let's say if we are using a particular carbon fabric, in this fabric is unidirectional, meaning all of the fibers are in the direction of the uh, green arrow. And as you see, the thickness of the fabric is only, you know, 1.3 millimeters, very lightweight, one on, less than two kilograms per square meter. And so you get a tension force of um, 6,000 pounds per inch, you know, in this fabric. So if you put this fabric on that wall or slab, you see that every six inch of this fabric gives you the same force as one of those steel bars. So you can say that a layer of this fabric is equivalent to number seven, grade 60 placed at six inches or a you know, metric equivalent of it shown here. Of course, you can appreciate that this installation of this fabric had, adds very little weight to your structure. If you're like, for example, if you're doing seismic upgrade of a building, imagine putting shot creating a masonry wall or concrete wall you know, and adding uh, 200 millimeter of concrete on it versus putting a layer of this fabric on it. So it doesn't add much weight or thickness, and it's also so much easier to uh, install. So that's kind of like the 
original idea on how this works. Some of the advantages of FRP, it has high tensile strength, two to three times that of steel. It's lightweight, as you've noticed. The materials do not corrode and virtually last forever, and they're easy to install. Uh, you know, one of the ways to think of FRP is that when you take a new steel column, for example, and you want to put it in service, the first thing that we do, we paint it. The reason why we paint that steel is to prov uh, provide an impervious barrier for corrosion uh, protection on that steel. And of course, uh, you know, the problem with that uh, paint is that it is very thin and it would crack and peel off, you know, uh, pretty soon. But at a minimum, even if you don't want to give any credit for all of the strength that FRP provides, you can think of it as just a very thick and long lasting impervious barrier around your structure. And that's one of the ways that we use it in some of our projects is to protect, you know, or stop the rate of corrosion because you don't allow any uh, moisture or oxygen to reach to your structure. Another thing to note is that, you know, our environmental uh, list friends, you know, they always complain about these plastics that we throw in landfills and they would not disintegrate and decompose. And, and I agree with them. And, and I want you to know that when it comes to these FRP products, these are really a lot um, longer lasting and more durable than your milk carton, for example, because the resins that go into these FRP products like epoxy is far more durable than what you have in a milk carton. And secondly, the fact that these are reinforced with these fibers, it means that they will not uh, break or, or you know, crack and, and easily fall apart. So, but hopefully we can all agree also that if there is one application where we don't mind our materials not disintegrating and having a very long service life, it's for renewal of our infrastructure, which is what we are doing here. So as I mentioned, there are various codes available and I just show you these ACI committee 440 has them as I also told you Canadians have their own codes. Ashto for bridges, it has a code you know that you see here with various chapters on you know how to strengthen structures. They, they follow pretty much similar to the ACI and and they even this is just like to give you a detail like in Ashto, for example, they have various details of placing the um, fibers or you know, carbon fabric on the sides of a girder for tension or shear reinforcement, whether on two sides or U shape and, and so on, various details and how you can anchor them if needed. So I won't get into all of those details today. I thought before we really get into the main part of this presentation, uh, it would be helpful for you to see how our organization works because we're kind of a, a different animal, I think, compared to the other companies you have, uh, you're familiar with. So within the umbrella of Quake Wrap, first of all, we come up with a lot of creative ideas that I said we have about 20 or plus patents. Our own engineering in-house provide engineering design for our projects. We have also a manufacturing uh, business within uh, Quake wrap. So a lot of the products that I'll be showing you, we make them at, at our own facility. And then we have both in-house research and development lab, as well as we team up with other universities and government agencies to do tests. So, so we, you know, we, we really do a lot more than what a typical like, consulting firm uh, would do. And then on top of that, we, uh, we also have a construction company that does the installation of all these products. So we pretty much go full circle and offer these turnkey to our clients. And so today's presentation, most of what I will be showing you really is in this circle that some of the ideas that we have developed and how we are using them in the field. But having said that, I wanna emphasize that we do team up with a lot of engineers like yourselves on your project. Like Brian, we have worked with you, with your other colleagues, we are I'm working on some other projects in Michigan with them. So we always work with consultants. We can provide you our sealed engineering calculations and you as the engineer of record would include it in your package to submit to your client. The same way with contractors, we uh, both train contractors, 
Um, and in many cases, we either as we are the subcontractor to a GC or we become the GC and hire another local subcontractor. And lastly, just to remind you that some of these details that I said are available on our website and please go ahead and feel free to use them for your projects. So, um, I uh, the first part of this presentation, like I said, I want to show you some of the applications of those wet layup uh, applications. And I figured, you know, since you're mostly interested in bridges, I'll show you a few of those. This one was a really interesting project in uh, the state of New Mexico about 16, 17 years ago. They were building two nine span bridges on Interstate 10. They finished the westbound bridge, put all of the traffic on that. And one day during the construction of the sister bridge that was going eastbound, the inspector tells the contractor that it looks like you're not putting enough steel in the deck of this bridge. He says, no, this is exactly how I finished the other one. Well, long story short, they realized that he had left half of the steel out of the entire deck of the westbound bridge, brand new bridge. You know? So instead of tearing it down, now, I, in fact, I remember I went there and looked at it when, when you know, remember now at that time, they had all of the east and westbound traffic going over this one bridge. And you could see that every time these trucks would go over, you would get these wide cracks in the middle of the span and just, you know, the bridge would flutter. So instead of tearing the bridge down, very much like those brick beams, we provided these bands of carbon fabric. They were installed on the underside of the bridge. And today, if you drive over this bridge, you really cannot tell any difference between the two bridges. And uh, as I mentioned, this is about 16, 17 years old. A more recent project, uh, this is in downtown Phoenix about a couple of years ago. We worked with WSP. They were the engineer of record on this. At, at this major intersection, they are, they, they, their plan is to widen Highway I-10. And uh, you notice here there is this uh, water canal. It's called the Arizona Canal that uh, a pair of box culverts carry the water in of Arizona Canal under I-10. Uh, as a result of this project, they realized that some of the old culverts that were here, they were corroded. So they wanted to either repair them or replace them before adding the new, you know, widening of the road. And when you look at it, here are the box culverts. They are 14 feet long, two of, uh, wide, two of them. And the length of the repair that we were doing was about 380 uh, feet. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did, you know, this was WSP engineers uh, wish and we followed their wish, but we don't necessarily need to do it in our project. These, uh, you see, there was a fillet six inch by six inch at the end, but they wanted to enlarge that a little bit. So here you can see our guys are putting some doweling, some rebars, you know, into the uh, slab and the wall and then forming that fillet and then pumping concrete in there. So this on the right here, this is after the fillet has been uh, enlarged uh, from like into a 300 by 300 millimeter fillet. And then the installation of the fabric, it's done inside, you know, we put these bands that are two feet wide, they're going all the way across the, the 14 foot direction and, and slightly like about an inch or so overlap to create a complete impervious layer at the ceiling. So now no moisture or oxygen from here can attack the, the slab uh, because of that impervious barrier. Uh, cost wise, this project, it took, uh, it was $1.3 million was the complete repair of this project, which was only 5% of the estimated replacement cost at $25 million. So it took two and a half months to do the repair. We had zero disruption of service to traffic. The public didn't even know that our crew was work, working under this. And, and imagine if you were going to replace this, how much of a headache this would have created for uh, just the traffic control alone, not to mention the cost. So on projects like this, we can keep track of the quality control by taking lot numbers of the products. There are also standard tests. For example, you know, ACI has a tension or adhesion test. And basically you take these 
50 millimeter pucks and glue them to the surface of the you know, carbon or the concrete and let it cure overnight. And then the next day you do a pull test on it. They're supposed, to, if they break at 200 PSI minimum is the limit. Typically, most of the things we do are, you know, seven, 800 PSI, like you see in here. Um, for the fabrics themselves, you can make a witness panel that you saturate a 300 by 300 millimeter piece of fabric, saturate it, put it between two layers of glass, and then, you know, a couple of days later, they can, they're ready to be sent to a laboratory to make coupons out of them and test them in the future to see, make sure that you have the same strength that was specified. Um, we are also, um, uh, our products are certified by International Code Council or ICC. So that's another level of, uh, you know, security for you to make sure that the quality control is there. I just uh, wanted to show a couple of applications of, again, on bridges, just to show that one of the nice things about this carbon fabric is that because it is so flexible, it can conform to the shape of a, like an ashto girder, for example, so it can easily follow that contour. There are, you know, there is something that you need to be aware of. You don't want to bend them over a very sharp corner. So we usually require that any sharp corners are, uh, you know, rounded to like a one inch diameter to make sure that the, you don't break the fibers as you go around that corner. But a lot of times these repairs that we do, you know, like one night we can close, uh, you know, a couple of lanes of traffic, work on one side of the bridge, and then, you know, the next night you can just close uh, this, uh, this, you know, this portion and work on that, the other side of it. So it's, you know, relatively little disruption to of service. Um, this is actually the old way that we would repair a column of a bridge, and I'll then show you in a minute the, the new one, but uh, so these were from, like you see, 2005 that we were doing some work in Indiana. If you have a concrete column that is corroded, like shown here, then you have to first, uh, you know, after you do the cleaning and uh, all of that, you would have to patch that concrete to make the surface flat because you cannot wrap the fabric around a, uh, an uneven surface like this. So you have to patch it up, wait for that patching material to dry or cure before you can apply your start wrapping the, your fabric around it as you see here and in a you know in a couple of minutes i'll show you how uh, what we can do with the new system that would be a lot faster than this so here we get to that new system which is one of our products is uh, uh this pile medic you know which is for repair of piles and you know uh, I know your colleague Brian uh, has used it on some of his projects and we have written papers on that. So, and we actually repair missing piles too, not just, you know, the ones that are corroded. Uh, so let's just say, see how this works. So we can take a, say, 1.2 meter wide band of fabric and in our manufacturing plant, we apply a resin to that fabric and subject it to heat and pressure. and from that flexible fabric, we make a very thin laminate, which although flexible, but it is it can stand or hold its shape. It's not as flimsy as a fabric. So these laminates then they come in a coil like 1.2 meter wide by typically you know 120, 150 meter long. So you have a lot of material on a single row. These are actually what we had shipped to a contractor in Saskatchewan that he's repairing a lot of uh, bridge pier, uh, columns, timber bridge parts. And we did just this one pallet, you can do a number of bridges as we have listed here. So one thing really is the compactness of the system and the fact that you do not need to know ahead of time what shape, shape or size of pile you plan to repair. Then uh, there are these spacers that we have developed. I'll show you in a minute how we use those. We have these. Uh, ports. The ports are used, you know, for grout injection, uh, as you see on the right. And also we have a seal for the bottom of these in case in some repairs, you're not repairing the full height of the column, you know, how to stop the grout from flowing through. So a typical application process would be that you take those spaces that I showed you, put several of them through a zip tie and snap them around 
the column. You put those every three, four feet along the height of the column. You put a, a set of those, as you see here. And then your longitudinal bars will get snapped into these uh, spaces. The, these are designed to receive either a 12 or 19 millimeter bar. So, so you snap those in place. Then when it comes to the laminate, our typical detail is to apply the laminate 720 degrees plus eight inches, so 200 millimeter. So you measure twice the perimeter of the pile or column plus 200 millimeter, and you cut a piece of that laminate to that length, apply the epoxy to the second half of this laminate, and then you wrap the laminate tightly around those spacers and the pile. So the spacers define the shape of size of the jacket that you're creating around your pile. And then if it is, for example, in water, you can now you have created the 1.2 meter tall shell. You lower that into water and then you repeat that those steps three, four and five, you know, and every time you add 1.2 meter, 1.2 meter until you go as as deep as you would like to go. Typically along the height of the pile, uh, normally you would provide a 100 millimeter overlap between each of these 1.2 meter jackets. Then at the end, once you're done, then you can seal the bottom of it if needed, and then uh, fill it the annular space with concrete, as you know, and that becomes like uh, what you'll end up with. So this is, you know, a part of the, uh, the approval process that the U.S. military had in the last day. But I want you to see this jacket, for example, at this demo. This is two of those bands, so we have 1.2 meter and another 1.2 meter. You see the port, you know, that here from here they're injecting as well as the bottom seal that how it holds the, you know, grout from uh, falling through. So here is a recent project at emergency repair that we did. And I, you know, you can see the contrast between what we do now versus what we were doing 20 years ago in that bridge in Indiana. So. In this case, uh, we are not doing any repair on the set, on the concrete at all. This this was a corroded, deteriorated column. So uh, you see here that we have already put the spacers around the column. There's like one, two, three sets of spacers, and then the rebars, longitudinal bars, are snapped already. They are in place. We have put two of them on each side, and the laminate, the crew have cut the laminate in the back, and uh, you see this left half of it is covered with a with an epoxy. So they bring it over now and they wrap it around the column. And as they wrap it, that second layer, which was covered with epoxy, uh, sticks to the first layer. And once they've done that, they slide it down into below grade. So now we have built like a 1.2 meter tall jacket. At this stage, you hold the jacket together with some ratchet straps temporarily so it doesn't unwind itself while the epoxy gets a chance to cure. So we repeat that three times here, you know, 1.2 meter, 1.2, 1.2. Now, what, what, once you've gone all the way to top, then at that point, you can start pumping or, or pouring with a tremi method, put the concrete in the annular space, and there you have it. So it's really in a very short time, you can repair these with no weighting or no surface prep and all. And going back to my uh, earlier slide about uh, creating an impervious layer, this is what we mean. Like by now, right now, when you have what you have created is uh, there is this is so this is actually the thickness of this is about uh, uh, roughly uh, 0.1 inch. So it, so it's a you know this is almost like one and a half millimeter in thickness right now two millimeters so there is very little chance of any moisture or oxygen penetrating you know through this system so it would bring the column to a halt if any of you are working in you know in, in canada you have a lot of like mining clients for example this is what can be used in mines where you have chemical sprays now not only you have protected the column but anything that sprays on it just comes off of and and this video shows uh, actually the very first job that we did underwater with this some 15 years ago in Miami. So here's a contractor is cutting the length of the laminate. This epoxy that we have, it cures underwater. So we never use any coffer dams on any of the projects that we do. So they 
put the epoxy on the laminate, pass it to the guys, they wrap it around. Notice that you're not sticking the laminate to the column. There's that space between them. Hold it together with these ratchet straps and then they pump the grout in it. And then here is the finished uh, project. Uh, since this product was introduced, a lot of departments of transportation in U.S. have shown interest and have tested it for their own use. So Texas DOT did a study of steel H piles corroded to see how they can restore their capacity. Caltrans did a study of concrete piles that were damaged in an earthquake and see how quickly they could restore them. Nebraska Department of Roads, uh, but the biggest one of these was a study done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, multi-million dollar study over three years. And as a result, the pile medic is now the only system that the military has approved and we you know, sh ship it for them worldwide to use it. Uh, we've also worked with some utility companies to strengthen timber uh, utility poles and they've tested it. Um, I won't, again, won't go into a lot of these, but these reports of all of these are available on our website if you'd like to download them. The Cal Caltrans study, for example, which again, you can watch the video of it later on on your own. They took this column and uh, subjected it to lateral loads such that uh, three of the longitudinal bars on each face of the column fractured. And then the objective was to repair this and put it back in service without having to weld uh, those new rebars that were uh, broken. So we uh, did the repairs for them. And in fact, we showed them that these repairs could be done in 48 hours. You could put that bridge back to service and get all of its full capacity back. And here is just uh, the hysteretic behavior of the one before damage and after damage. Uh, these are again, we have papers on this as well as, you know, in that video you can uh, see. The Nebraska Department of Roads that was looking at timber uh, piles, they tested several of these piles uh, that they uh, intentionally damaged them to make an hourglass shape. And the objective was to see if they could restore uh, the capacity of uh, these piles. But uh, as you see in the graph here, all of these piles after the repair, they were significantly stronger than the you know, original des design capacity. So we have used a lot of these. In fact, you know, with Brian, we have used it and we've used, we just wrote a paper. In, in Canada alone, we, I think we've done around 200 or 300 of timber piles on various bridges, uh, strengthening like that. Now, when you're repairing a column or a pile, as you know, you when you provide that new reinforcing uh, steel, you typically have to provide both longitudinal rebars and then lateral ties around that. The problem with this is that now you have created a pretty heavy steel cage and the handling of this is something that you need a couple of divers to maneuver this into place. Uh, dive teams, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with it, dive teams are really expensive. So uh, a typical uh, four-man dive crew, typically they charge about $6,000 a day and they cannot even work eight hours because of safety rules. So, it, you know, you can see that how expensive it is. And if there's anything that you can cut on the hours of workforce, you know, that could be a major impact on the project cost. So, in contrast to this conventional method, for example, if you look at our system, once we put, you know, the diver, it's a one man job to wrap those, uh, snap those spacers around the column. He puts a few of those. The individual rebars are again, one man job. You can snap them in place, you know, that they, uh, they hold that. And then have, once you uh, bring in the jacket, now, the nice thing about our jacket is that, first of all, you see it goes 360 degrees without any uh, weak seam along the height of it. But also this jacket is equivalent to a 12 millimeter tie at 70 millimeter on center, which is really far more than what most of you would require for any of such applications. So what is nice then is that this pile medic system, we eliminate the need for reinforcing ties. And it's not, again, it's not just the saving of the cost of steel ties, but the, the cost of installation of a complete shell or, or you know, reinforcing cage like that versus individual bars it makes it a lot easier. Uh, this was a 
project uh, in uh, Australia that on a, on a major bridge that uh, the columns were suffering from alkali silica reaction. And you know, this ASR or some people call it the cancer of the concrete. It causes expansion of the concrete. So in the years before we got involved with this project, they had in fact tried two different jacket systems and each of those after a couple of years had failed. Those were these conventional jackets that come in two half shells and you connect the, uh, you know, you put a pin or something to connect the edges. Uh, but uh, by nature, they are not that strong. They don't provide any confinement and they, they couldn't resist the expansion of the uh, this uh, ASR attack column. So here you see uh, on a barge, they have cut the laminate to the length they need, put the epoxy on it, and then they pass it down to the diver below. And here the diver wraps it around uh, the pot. The cage here that you see, has, it's not anything structural. This river is infested with crocodiles, so we have to protect the divers from crocs, and that's what this is for. Uh, and, and then here is kind of, you know, at, at the completion, there were uh, four uh, piers, and each of them have 10 columns, so the total of 40 of these were repaired on this bridge. And this is, again, seven, eight years ago. Uh, it's doing fine. We have published a couple of papers on this in, in ACI and International Bridge Conference. If you'd like, I can send you those. Uh, this is was a big uh, job, about five over 500 of these timber piles uh, some uh, six, seven, seven years ago in Virginia. And here you see some of the piles uh, are not only really hourglass shape, but sometimes they're totally missing. So what we do, we you can span the rebars across that missing portion and then when you wrap the jacket around it and fill it with concrete you create a new basically concrete pile uh, around that um, and here you know i just wanted to point out that when you have tight areas like that it's uh, or you know like near the abutment of a bridge where this might be this timber pile might have been connected with some bolts or nailed to the abutment wall, you can cut those and all you really need is like two, three millimeter space to pass the laminate through. So uh, in tight spaces, you know, this works pretty well. Um, these are some of the bridges in Canada that I was mentioning to you. Uh, in the, they, most of these are in Manitoba and uh, Saskatchewan. And so uh, they are in very, as you can imagine, a lot of these uh, railroad bridges are on remote sites. So, the railroad provides a rail truck to the contractor and they put the you know the float down so that his crew can work on it uh, this were done in uh, late september or early october we were hoping to beat snow but apparently mother nature had different plans so you see that there was a couple of days of snow to deal with so epoxy is usually the, you know we don't want them to get that cold before they are installed so the contractor had made this shell and then pumped hot air in there to keep the resin at ambient temperature while you know they were installing. One of the ways of repairing timber piles is that you can wrap the laminate very tightly around the pile, uh, creating a very tiny annular space. And then you inject a low viscosity resin by gravity feed that resin goes through and it fills all the voids and cracks in the timber pile. And because the resin has a compressive strength of about three times that of uh, the, the old timber part. Whatever holes or cavities we fill with this, of course, is going to add a lot more to the strength of the part, and not to mention the confining effect of the jacket all the way around uh, your wood. Um, a lot of people ask us, what, what do you do with these you know, bolts if you have a bracing member? These bolts can be removed. Uh, one way is to remove them and leave a peg, wooden peg in their place, then wrap the jacket and, you know, uh, at that time you can poke a hole and remove that uh, peg and uh, then, you know, reins reinsert the original bolt and connect the, uh, you know, the, the member, the, the brace at that point. And here again, just to show you that how, you know, when you have a tight space, uh, you can get these, you know, installed. Um, in uh, cases, so so you've seen some concrete applications and some timber applications. 
in those cases, you know, it's a fair assumption to say that there is good bond transfer between concrete and timber or concrete and concrete. But if you have a steel pile, like what we were doing here in this project, uh, you can't make that assumption. So the best thing here would be to provide either weld shear studs like we do in, in bridge girders, or but in this project, particular project, they had a lot of flammable materials and no hot works or welding was allowed on this site. So we had to come up with a new product that we developed for this. This is called a shear wrap. And these, we make them in our manufacturing facility. They're custom made uh, steel bands with high strength bolt two on uh, each. So there are two half circuits that they go around the pile both above and below the damaged area and we calculate how many of these we need and then these are become you know they are torqued to a specific torque to the column and uh, each of them then is good to transfer a certain amount of force through shear and, and friction basically so they get encased ultimately in the jacket and the grout so you won't see them at the end but how the mechanism of this works then is that let's say if you have a steel pile with a corroded or missing portion, you put uh, calculate how many of these shear wraps you, we need, we put them above and below the damage zone. Then when we put the jacket around it and pour concrete in there, now the load as it comes, when it gets to that shear wrap, it goes out of the steel pile into the concrete, bypassing the damaged area. And then below that, it goes through the shear wrap back into the good portion of the steel. So this shear wrap creates a continuous load path while uh, totally eliminating any welding on site. We have found out that because of the challenges of welding, welding underwater is really not that easy to do. So even on jobs where welding is allowed, we, you know, we do use these uh, a lot. We have a similar device for H piles, which we call a shear clamp, and that also we, we use those uh, uh, quite a bit too. So here is a recent project in Mexico where about 70 of these piles were getting repaired. And this was again, you know, severely corroded or missing portions of the pile. So as you can see here, the shear wraps are installed. And then if we want to create, like in this case, if we want to create a moment connection, we would of course extend the bars into the underside of the deck, epoxy anchor them, and then, you know, pour the concrete uh, around them. Uh, this was a, a another bridge in, uh, Indiana was about five, six years ago. There were two parallel bridges and each of them had 22 bends in them. Uh, and we repaired about 256 piles. You know, these are 14 inch diameter by 0.25 quarter inch thick. And uh, they were originally actually cast in a ring of concrete but uh, their corrosion had still continued because you know moisture can get through that concrete a little bit. So the, the walls had become thinner and that's why they asked us to do the repair. We repaired a total of about 670 meter length of these on this project. So the capacity of the pile, for example, in axial capacity, we had 1895 kilonewton was the original strength. After we retrofitted it, we provided increase it for them. They didn't really need to be strengthened, but but we did, you know, increase it to 2300 kilonewton. Likewise for the moment capacity from 207 kilonewton meters to 226. Uh, and I know there's always everybody is wondering how much these things cost. So this is again, it's a five, six year old project, but I just put in the cost. So on this job back six years ago, uh, it was under 2000 meter uh, or 2000 US dollars per meter of the uh, pile materials and installation, everything come up. Uh, if you have a concrete pile like this one, again, you don't need to worry about shear wraps and there is good bond between uh, the, the concrete and, and steam. Uh, this was for a major project we did for the Nigerian Petroleum Corporation. <laughs> and I also like to joke to say that we are the only ones I know who took a million dollar from Nigerians. So uh, this this was a pretty you know a good successful project for them. Save the jetties that that they had. So now we get into another product which is you know we start using the Sanovich construction uh, product. The Sanovich co concept you know as 
uh, you you can appreciate it as a structural engineer. Let's say if you have a case where what you need is not just the tensile strength of your material, but it's uh, ring stiffness or compressive strength of it. So you could obviously take many layers of carbon and add layer after layer to get a thick plate, but that becomes quite expensive. So what we are looking at is, let's say if this is two layers of carbon, we could take these two layers and put something in between to spread these two layers. So now you see if you increase the uh, thickness by twice that thickness, your stiffness becomes seven times more than the original one. And if you stretch, you know, put a little bit thicker material in between, you can get 37 times stiffness, that stiffness. Meanwhile, keep in mind that cost-wise, going from option one, you know, to option two, to option three, you're only adding maybe 10%, 15% at every step, but you're gaining a lot of additional uh, strength. So one of the ways of providing that spacer between them is we have these fabrics that are called three-dimensional fabric. So the fabric is comprised of a top layer and a bottom layer of fabric stitched together with these special uh, short piles of uh, glass. And we saturate the, the two layers of fabric simultaneously together. But if you let it sit on a table through a wicking action, these uh, piles or, or short fibers of glass soak up the resin and the second top layer of fabric rises above the first layer and you create this rigid structure with a lot of webs in between. So it's really a good way of making a very lightweight, rigid uh, plate, if you will. And you can then put your additional carbon or glass on top of that. So one of the ways that we use it, and I want to show you how we use it, for example, for repair of uh, culverts, is to you know, um, make a uh, sandwich construction type uh, pipe. And I won't spend much time on this thing, but, but basically we can use, as you see in a second, that we can make a pipe of any shape or size with this and use it either for slip lining a deteriorated pipe or culvert or for uh, with wet layup. And I'll show you one case of each. So for the wet layup app, uh, or for the slip lining, this project again is from our office in Australia. We were repairing an 80 foot long uh, culvert. And so the way this is done, we have a telescopic mandrel with tel telescopic arms. You stretch the arms to the dim dimension that you want and you wrap various layers of glass or carbon and the you know, core material over that mandrel. And this allow it to cure overnight. So then the next day you uh, collapse the mandrel and the pieces of pipes come out. So we made four pieces of these pipes for a 20 foot long, you know, in our office in uh, Brisbane, and then they get shipped to the job site. On the job site, here's the uh, corrugated metal pipe or CMP culvert that is, you know, partially collapsed. And that's an another advantage that we can custom make these pipes to any diameter that we want. We don't have to go with, you know, like 200 millimeter increments or anything like that. So. Uh, here is the pipes, you know, they're, they're put in, they're shoved inside of the uh, culvert and then the edges are, uh, you know, because this is allowed big enough for man entry, you can go, we go in there and with uh, a fabric seal the edges to create a continuous 80 foot long pipe and then the annular space gets filled with uh, concrete. And, but this is really what I want you yeah. to see that how light this pipe is that these two guys are pushing a 20 foot piece of pipe with no equipment, uh, you know, just by hand, pushing, pushing it in. And on a job like this one, which was in a remote site, this was a big cost saver for, for, the, for that client. These are a couple of other larger ones, like three meter, you know, diameters that have, uh, you know, we've done, uh, these happen to be in Australia. Uh, this, uh, is a different type of application if there is like in this case we have a tunnel underground uh, which is about 130 feet below grade and 12 foot in diameter so there's really no way to slip line any pipe in it so in uh, this was in right in downtown minneapolis under i-35 so at first you know they divert the groundwater and the snow melt that was coming in here 
and then the materials, we know, we sent the materials down a shaft, and then from the entrance to that shaft, you had to go almost one kilometer on foot to get to the point of repair inside of the tunnel. So they took it to that point of repair, and then we uh, build a fully structural liner inside of that pipe, which is, I think it holds a record for the largest uh, fully uh, structural liner at such a depth. And here you can see our guys putting various layers of the material on, you know, on this uh, pipe. The whole thickness was only about, you know, 1.47 inch or, you know, 37 millimeters. So it's a pretty thin, uh, but very strong uh, liner. Now we get to another application with the Sanovich construction. This is for repair, what we call a sheet pile repair system or spire. And uh, this obviously can be used for repair of bridge abutments or larger bridge foundations if they're submerged. So these panels that we make, they are 1.2 meter by about 7, 8 meter long, whatever length we need. And the thick, you know, the thickness of them is about 11, 12 millimeter. You can make them flat or in different shapes. Then on the job site, if you have, uh, we use these J bolts that they get hooked behind the corroded seawall. Then if needed, some FRP rebars can be added in the space between the webs. Then the panels, 1.2 meter wide, they are brought in front of the wall and they're connected through those J bolts. The edges of these panels are uh, uh, overlapped with, with an epoxy sealant also to make a continuous impervious. Again, remember, see, I go back to that, making an impervious layer or protective uh, to, to protect it from corrosion. So we make that impervious stay in place form basically. And then uh, if needed, we can use some strong backs on to minimize the deflection temporarily these will be removed later after we pump concrete in here but the thing to keep in mind is that you know look at like here the, one of these plates the divers two guys are swimming and carrying it to place a lot of these uh, especially for ports and piers when you have from the edge of the pier the seawall is set back so if you are going to repair this with a heavy steel plate, for example, you really cannot easily lower that, that steel plate with a crane from here and get it back there. <clears throat> but in our case, you know, it's light enough that it can be, you know, they can swim and get it to that location. And once it's all done, you know, you cut the ends of these J bolts that are sticking out. And as I say, the panels only weigh like 10, 11 kilograms per square meter. They're not, and that's above water. When you take them in water, they really become almost weightless in water. Um, you know, this product, since we introduced it about six, seven years ago now, it's really been received quite well. I'm surprised how many jobs we've already done with this. Right now we are using it, uh, the port of Melbourne in Australia is using this spire system to repair one kilometer of its seawall. We've been just specified for 620 uh, meter at the port of Dubai, as well as a bunch of other projects in US and <coughs> that, that you see listed here. And these are some that we are training the US military again was last November, showing them how to install this as a part of their training in uh, Port Wainimi in California. This one con contractor had a different use for this. So this is a breakwater that was severely corroded. As you see, it was a steel uh, sheet pile, but it's corroded. So he sandwiched that between two layers of these panels, you know, with through bolts and then poured concrete around them and put a uh, cap beam on top of that and made a, you know, very nice, now very long lasting repair for that. And this is, I, you know, I'd like you to see this because this is what we are just finishing a job like that. And it's quite a nice way of fixing some of uh, these types of projects. Repair of corroded piers. Repair of corroded structures in coastal regions is a global concern. The problem is even more challenging when the damage is under the pier and there is little headroom for the crew to work. Sheet pile repair or spire system is the latest invention from Professor Asani that offers a cost and time saving solution for such cases. Fiber reinforced polymer or FRP shells can be custom made to match the shape and size of the beams and deck. The required amount of steel or FRP reinforcing bars can be calculated by our engineers and installed individually or inserted in the shells. 
these lightweight shells are lifted in place and secured with anchor bolts. The annular space between the shell and the structure is filled with grout or concrete from above or below the deck. The impervious shells will remain in place, protecting the host structure against future corrosion. So on this project, just so that you know, the, the, the beams, they had almost like 50% loss of reinforcing bars due to corrosion, as you can see here. And the original design, by the way, was that uh, they, they wanted to build a uh, with timber on site, build formwork around the beams, and then uh, put you know additional rebar in there and pour concrete, and then later on remove that uh, timber formwork. That option uh, turned out to be more expensive than what we did, and not to mention that in our case now you have a protective layer that stays there forever. So these are you know they they can I mean these are being shipped now from our off manufacturing here in Tucson going to the job site in Texas but you can see that they're pretty large sections you know two meter tall by four and a half meter long so uh, what we had to do in in this case was uh, because we are not really as you notice we are not using the spire panel as a reinforcing element it is really just a stay in place formwork so here we were our crew was adding the rebar on the job site inside of the shells before they are lifted in place like that then they're secured with these row of bolts that you see along the, the side and then uh, using these two grout ports we pump concrete in the annular space and fill it like that so this is the picture of this project as of about three weeks or so ago all of the main beams have been done on the port and we are right now finishing these uh, bull noses that are just like smaller pieces. But by, when we are all done with this, the entire section here, everything would be encapsulated in FRP. Uh, again, that protection and not allowing any moisture or salt uh, water to attack that. So once I saw on this project that we are adding rebar to it, this just happened over the last seven, eight months. We came up with a new product <laughs> and a new patent. This is called Spire Plus. So Spire Plus is really the same as that Spire, the old one, except that it has a built-in reinforcing element, basically. So these T-profiles that you see here, they are like your rebars, except instead of being round, they are flat. And we coat the entire inside face of this with epoxy coated and sand coated, so it bonds really well to, to concrete. So they come in, you know, the, the three feet by 20 foot long panels like that. And you can use them the same way as we did before with the original spire. You can repair seawalls, you can repair, you know, bridges, for example, like that. And we, uh, this is just a couple of months ago, we were doing these tests because this, as I said, this is a brand new product. We are getting a lot of interest in this product, by the way, already. But this is a test. So we made, uh, this is uh, eight inches or, 200 millimeter wide by 100 millimeter tall that we are testing. And so you see the two T profiles embedded in here. These are really like our, our reinforcing materials for this. So as we test these, it's, you know, you can see that how much uh, load and deflection this, this is taking. So these are equivalent to number six grade 60 at three and a half inch uh, on center or, you know, or a lot of steel. I don't have the metric equivalence, but it's a lot of really steel uh, for this. So how you could use this, for example, if you have on land, for example, maybe if you have a deteriorated bridge, instead of spending a lot of time surface prepping and, you know, patching and drying, waiting for it to dry and all of that, and, you know, meanwhile, disrupting traffic, you could literally overnight have this made on the side of the road and one night come pick it up, you secure it in place and pump concrete around it in a few hours. You have your formwork, you have all of the reinforcing elements built into this, and uh, as well as this stay in place form to protect your structure from corrosion in the future. The same thing can be done on, you know, on water if you have a corroded, uh, deteriorated structure like that. Um, the last thing I think that I have here is that, you know, uh, we, well, maybe you folks in Vancouver also probably, you know, inland of Canada, you don't have it, but in Vancouver, you probably have issues with global warming and rising sea level. So this product called EC wall, which is a play with word of, it's an easy seawall. So we use these to 
increase the height of existing seawalls and protect them against corrosion. We are doing a few jobs like that in Florida right now. So in this case, you would again take the same panels and bolt them to the top of your existing seawall if you have, you know, and add a, uh, an impervious moisture barrier, you know, a sealant here and add the next panel and next panel. Um, we don't really need any additional rebar, but if needed, you could add them. And uh, the non-corroding oops, Let me just we go here. Uh, oh yeah, I guess like maybe maybe yeah. This is at the end when when you're done with this, it looks like this. Basically, you have another set of these panels on the land side, and you fill the space in concrete. Uh, and you know, and you can uh, uh, make uh, some uh, architectural improvements here. For example, make pathways or planters on the land side to make it more attractive for the user the videos of these are available i won't take much of your time you can you can do that just the very last item i think that i have here is for repair of these large mo like mooring cells and other larger marine structures these typically they corrode at the water level and the ballast would come out of there and cause instability of the structure so now we are actually making the pile medic laminates that before it was 1.2 meter wide. We have now um, managed to make these as wide as three meters wide. So you can take a three meter wide, and they come in three meter wide by, you know, like two, 300 meter long rows. So you can cut the length that you need. And just like we repair the pile, now you can repair a very large, <laughs> think of it like a pile on steroids basically you do the same thing rapid you know maybe three meters tall push it in water and add another layer and then you know finish uh, this like that again this one there's a video for it there so 